Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day today. Um, and I bring you blessings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thanking God for your life, thanking God for what he's doing uh, for you, in you, and as well as uh, uh, through you. Uh, looking at my own life, I'm seeing so much of God's mercies and grace. Um, God has been raining blessings and, uh, in every way, left and right. There seem to be major breakthroughs, major manifestations of God's blessings, and I'm extremely grateful uh, because these are things that none of us deserve. But because of God's mercies, I believe that the same grace is being extended to you as well because God, his love is for all. I would like to invite you to reconsider a few things with me this morning. Okay. And one of the things I'd like us to look into and seriously look into is what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Many of us are busy uh, traveling, uh, doing all kinds of things and, you know, uh, making a lot of noise within the, uh, you know, a lot is going on within the, within, the, within the body of Christ around the world in the name of the gospel. Uh, we can quote so many verses, and we do quote many verses, including myself, you know, and uh, but we'd like to know what is the gospel? What makes it the gospel? It's easy to say that uh, uh, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I believe the gospel. I live the gospel and all that. But sometimes when you don't know what it is, you can't define it. It's hard to, or if you don't know it uh, well, it, it, it makes your confidence a weak confidence. And looking at the book of Matthew, chapter 4, 24, verse 14, if you want to come with me, let's read a little bit. Matthew, chapter 24, verse 14. We have been studying the signs of uh, the end times, and uh, it, it brought us to a place where Jesus made this comment here. Um, verse, from verse 14, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. The good news of the kingdom, or the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. This is a major responsibility that God has given to us. The reason I say it's a major responsibility is, what he's saying essentially is what we are commissioned to do, we determine how soon Jesus Christ comes. We are the ones commissioned to propagate what we call, what the scripture call, what the, the, the Jesus called the good news of the kingdom. Now, what we are called to preach, let me emphasize that it is not the message of the cross. It is not the cross. It is not a prayer ministry. It is not these or that, as we've been talking, as many people do. I'm not saying messages of the cross and teachings on prayer are not good. They are good, but if somebody commissions you, you are, you are hired to do something, but you better know what your job description is, and then you present that the way you are instructed to present it, all right? But before we read verse 14 of that Matthew chapter 24, if you started in verse 12, uh, verse 4, let's go to verse 4. Verse 4, something interesting happened here. Um, it says, uh, maybe we take it from verse 1 because of the way the story is so beautiful, so we don't break it halfway. 
as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings, but he responded, do not see all these buildings. Uh, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat at the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return? He, he, he said, what sign? That is a, a singular, not what signs. What sign in the, in the Greek translation? He says what it means, what is the specific thing that will happen? You know, that, that is just to point out to one specific event that would take place to, her, to, to, to be, to indicate that, yes, this is the last uh, stroke that is going to break the camels, uh, the camels back. Uh, look at it. He said, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? These are two things that, the, if, if you read it in Greek, these are two things that he's asking here. There are two things here. What will be the signal of your return? That's number one. He said, what sign will signal your return? That's not one question. And the end of the time, because these two things are not going to happen at the same time. One will happen and there will be a period of time before the second one will happen. All right. The return of Christ does not necessarily signal, it's not, it does not indicate the end of this age as we know it. Jesus will come first and after a while, then uh, when he comes, he's going to take the sins, the believers away. And as he's going to take the believers away, then the devil is going to spew out uh, his, his venom, his vengeance against those who are left. That's what, okay. And Jesus told them, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. Don't let anyone mislead you. Many times we skip this and then we go for verse five. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So we forget that very important comment there when he says, don't let anyone deceive you. One can only be deceived when the person is a stranger to truth. One can be deceived when the knowledge of truth is just a hearsay. One can be deceived when one is not grounded in the truth, even if you think you've heard it before. One can be deceived if you are not averse, if you are not, if you are not, um, how do you put it? If you are not confident in what you believe or what you have seen. Now, so now it went on to say, to indicate so many uh, terrible things that, we, in fact, let's, let's read it together, if you don't mind. Um, you will hear of wars, verse 6, and threats of wars, but don't panic. Many people's hearts are, are failing them because of all this. They say, oh, the world is coming to an end. Jesus said, don't relax, don't panic. Yes. These things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. We are going through these things right now. Inflation, even an artificial inflation. I call it artificial because there's no reason. There's no uh, logical reason for the inflations we are experiencing right now. But he says uh, uh, it, there will be famines uh, and earthquakes and many parts in many parts of the world, but all of these is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated of all 
over the world because you are my followers. Oh, oh, I think we need to wake up to this. Many of us uh, testify to um, whatever blessing we have as the as a sign that we are righteous. Many people do that, like we are righteous. It's true, we are, uh, or that God has blessed us. It's true, he does, but there is also another side that we are not, we don't preach, especially in the Western world. Our Western gospel does not include persecution. We talk too much about blessings. Oh, God bless you. God did this. God, that God. It's, it's true. I believe it. But the scripture is saying here that because you are my followers, expect to be arrested persecuted, and some may be killed. You will be hated all over the world because of my followers. One of the things that the devil has used in our world today is the, the, uh, our interest. We like being liked. We enjoy being liked. We want to be, we want to have, uh, we, we, that we're using the worldly system to uh, run for or pursue fame and popularity. How many followers does he have on Facebook or does she have on this, on Instagram or these? Oh, he must really be popular. That's why he has so many people. And the greed, the taste, you've acquired the taste for uh, an idol. When you become an idol, you, now you begin to mix up and dilute the truth so that people will like your messages. Now, he's saying here, you'll be hated all over the world. That means, uh, <laughs> oh, God, hallelujah. You'll be hated all over the world, it is part of the price of the gospel. It's part of the price of our relationship with the king. Say so you'll be hated all over the world. While some people idolize being liked and trying to pursue followers and change this and water down that to make themselves likable and to be followed and to get high ratings, other people are being arrested for standing up for truth in our communities, for our children, for the dying, the weak, the helpless. Uh, so we have got to reevaluate what we are actually pursuing. Are we pursuing the popularity from the world or are we pursuing the gospel of the kingdom? Now he says, from, because you are my followers, right? He says, so you'll be hated. Now look at verse, uh, verse 10. And many will turn away from me because, uh, turn them away from me and betray and hate each other. Mm. Mm -hmm. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many. Sin will be rampant everywhere. We are walk, we're living through that. We are living through that right now, okay? And the love of many will grow cold. People become desensitized. People become passive. They become dull. The, the passion uh, for Christ, the passion for godliness begins to wane. So the love of many will grow cold. Their mouth can still say, I love God. But if the action doesn't back it, then it is, it is not real love. Because you see, love is what it does. It is not what it says necessarily. Love is what it does. Love is in the action. Love is in the act it performs. So, okay. It says sin, verse 12, will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Did you see endurance here? The term endurance means, or it signifies that what you'll be going through is not going to be comfortable. 
but you have got to stay in it. You've got to keep, hold yourself be faithful. You gotta, you got I mean, keep yourself focused and, and the Holy Spirit will help you to be faithful. But the determination to say, no matter what happened, I am not going to change. This is what the truth is. I'm going to hold it with both hands. If I lose this, that's all right. If I lose that, that's all right. If people hate me, that's all right. If I'm uh, uh, arrested, that's all right. But you are holding and standing for the truth. Okay. And then he says, that is the, he said, but, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Mm. And the good news about the kingdom would be preached throughout the whole world so, so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you can see from verse 1 to 25 uh, to 14, we have just seen that in the in the midst of all the the, the, the disaster in the midst of all the betrayal, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of chaos, the midst of hunger and farming and earthquakes and wars and, and all the confusion and persecutions, Jesus audaciously said, guys, listen, when all this is happening, the gospel must still be preached. And this gospel must be preached the ends of the earth. And that is when the good, the end shall come. So in other words, while the, the devil is doing whatever he thinks he wants to do, I want you to be zeroed in on the gospel of the kingdom. You are the distributors of the gospel of this kingdom. Why? Because you are the citizens of this kingdom. So the question here is, what is the gospel? Now, I want to say here in Mark chapter 16, let's look at it together. This is another beautiful thing. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, uh, verse 15. Let's look at it, 16, verse 15. Okay, it says here, then he told them, go into all the world. He here ref referring to Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel, <clears throat> and preach the good news to everyone, everyone, okay, everyone. If you're a senator, start with your colleagues. If you're a prime minister, start with your colleagues. If you're a president of a nation, start with your colleagues. If you're in the army, start in the Navy, start in the, bus in the business area, start. If you are a mother uh, at home, start with your neighbors, start with your people. Children, start with your friends, okay? Uh, uh, husbands, start with people that you that are within your sphere of influence. He said to be preached to everyone. If you are from the whatever part of the world you come from, start presenting the gospel to people around you in your language, in the learned language, your second language, the third language. Use everything. So he's saying, while all these uh, uh, things are going on. You, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached. He said that in Matthew. Now he says, go into all the world. When he sings, when he's saying all the world here, he's talking about the, the cosmos, the, the systems of the world, this, the, all the system, the governmental system, educational system, the, the scientific system, whatever system, the political system, uh, the, the whatever, wherever you find yourself, the systems of the world, okay? Preach the good news uh, to everyone. Everyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Everyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. This is why we do not believe in child baptism, because a child cannot uh, believe, cannot indicate his faith, cannot um, uh, it's not at the age where he can say, yes, I believe. The understanding has, in, it has to be developed first. The understanding has to be cultivated. In other words, it has to come of age to know right from wrong first. And then he says, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, many people believe they are not baptized because they don't want to be baptized. Amen. You got to, if you want to take one part of the gospel, make sure you don't leave the other. It's not for you and me to pick and choose. 
All right. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. You know, sometimes we handle the gospel the, uh, as if Jesus, like, okay, if I do this, he will do that. So let me do this so he can do that, and then I'm good. So in other words, it, it shows that he's not your Lord yet. Because when he's your Lord, you don't buy from him. You don't bargain. You don't negotiate. Whatever he instructs becomes your focus. Whatever his instruction is, becomes something that you do passionately and willingly. All right? He says, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Look at verse 17. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out devils or demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. For those who said speaking in tongues is not, uh, they are not interested in it just because somebody mess up something or the teaching is not straightforward does not mean that you should look for it for yourself, okay? He says, speak in new tongues, all right? They'll be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything, he didn't say go look for snakes and handle them. But in case something dangerous, this, the term snakes and scorpions here, and you read them in the Bible, they signify the devil and his manifestations or the devil and his works. Anything that, that will hurt, that is dangerous to human life, that is what he's, he's saying here. He said, if they drink, can you see if, don't go trying poison in the name of this gospel that say it wouldn't hurt me. So you go and grab poison and drink it. Say if they, so let me use the term, if they inadvertently drink something or eat something that is poisonous, it will not, uh, it, it, it wouldn't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Now, the gospel, simply put, is everything that is part of the promise of the New Testament, that is the new covenant. Everything that God has promised us as part of the new covenant. When we say testament, it means covenant. The old covenant is no longer what we are living in. All right? We have a new and a better covenant. And this covenant says something here. Um, let me, let me, let me sh share this with you here. Oh, this is, this is, this is, this is amazing. Romans chapter 10. Let's look at it together. Okay. Romans chapter 10. Let's look at it from verse nine. Look at it. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, if you openly, many people are, are ashamed of Jesus, so they do it, they follow, but they follow secretly because I don't want to lose my business connections. I don't want to lose my uh, position as in so-so. I don't want to jeopardize these opportunities that are coming. So I'm just going to keep Jesus tucked in under my garment. Jesus becomes a closet Jesus. <laughs> you know what about Jesus said in the Bible? He said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you when I stand in the presence of my father. In other words, I'm not going to mention you. If you're ashamed to identify with me before your colleagues and friends and family and, you know, and people in your circle, I will be ashamed of you when I stand in the presence of my father. He says, though, if you openly declare that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. You are made right, made right. In other words, the anger of God is turned away and you can stand with confidence before your heavenly father. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. I mean, if you have uh, someone that you love, you, would, you don't hide the person. You don't hide the person you love. 
especially if this person has saved you from death and has done nothing but good to you. Okay? Now, l- listen here. Let's go again to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. I'd like to touch it briefly, and then we'll be through. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The 17 says here, this means that anyone who belongs, because we have seen how you, when you hear the gospel, you believe, uh, you, you, you publicly declare and you believe in your heart, right? So he says, in that, then you are saved. That means you have a right standing with God. You, you are on the side of God now. He said, but uh, verse 17 says here, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to himself. Now, can I tell you what the gospel is? The gospel comprises of everything that, the, that, that is contained in the New Testament. In the New Testament, from sharing or partaking or experiencing the nature of Christ Jesus, the nature of God himself, to the healing of headache and the cleaning out of a runny nose. In other words, healing of sniffles. All right? Everything that is contained there becomes the gospel. The gospel is primarily that God is no longer upset with you. You don't need to worry about keeping all the laws before you are accepted because in Christ Jesus, his qualification becomes ours. What he died and qualified and his blood was used to erase completely all our sins and we have been made brand new people. The gospel includes uh, the fact that we are no longer the old people we used to be, we are a new species of persons, of people. We are brand new people in Christ Jesus. In the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, please, just take a look at it. There's something beautiful here. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at it from verse 4. This is amazing. So God, is it? but God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ. So in other words, we are brand new people. When Jesus went to the cross and died and tasted spiritual death as well as physical death on our behalf, and his blood was used to wash away our sins, and his body was broken so that ours will be healed, the Bible says, Something here that is that is amazing, that is amazing. Because verse four of Ephesians chapter two, I'm reading from the NLT, by the way. But God so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. We were dead, so He gave us life. It is not the same old life that he returned to us because that old life is a life of sin. No, he returned to us. He gave us the life of Christ, the very life of Christ, the overcoming life of Christ, the righteous life of Christ, the sinless life of Christ, the eternal life of Christ. He say he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace that you've been saved for he raised us up from the dead along with Christ. Oh, come on now. Not only did he give us life, he lifted us up. He gave us life. He quickened us in the King James Version. He said, for he quickened us and raised us up. He quickened us together with Christ, raised us up together with Christ. And what is the next thing? And then he said, uh, from okay, I'm reading the coming back to the NLT. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of grace, as, a, as examples of incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ. 
oh, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. What you've done for us is so good. So that is the gospel. That is the gospel. The gospel is, the Bible says, you go and be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he says, you are going to be my witnesses. Is, is the witnesses here, it's not just hearsay. No, many people are relying on their strength, relying on gifts. I appreciate God for the gift of eloquence and, and the knowledge of the word. It's good to really study the word and know the word so that you can present it well. But it is not just by words. The, the, when you talk, you check the meaning of the word witness. It's not just somebody who has seen something to report. It's also a proof and evidence. There has to be an evidence in your life that you are, that you are what, that, that you, you, what you're talking about. You, you have to, you, there has to be evidence in your life about what you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are proposing, you, you are presenting. So if it is gospel, that you are presenting, the gospel must affect you in such a way that there is real evidence in your life. Amen? Come on now. There has to be real evidence. If there's no evidence, don't be discouraged. Go back and stay on it until there is an evidence in your life. And evidence is not just a one-time thing that, oh, I got healed of this, or I got experienced Jesus this way. The evidence is our life. Every moment we are experiencing Jesus anew. It doesn't mean you are getting born again anew, but the life of God flowing in you, manifesting in you, the power of God being displayed in and through you makes you the one, uh, a true witness. It makes you a true and an authentic witness. When the life of righteousness, the life of holiness, the life of love dominates you and that is who you are naturally and this requires a consistency this requires pursuit this requires tenacity this requires endurance this requires patience so that as you grow in the word in the covenant in the new life and you keep experiencing christ over and over just as the holy spirit continues to teach you and remind you and draw you back it deeper into the word of God, what you, are, what you are going to experience is a transformation of your own life so that whenever you come up and you open your mouth, Jesus' heart is heard. When you go into action, the love of God is displayed. Do you know one thing? The essence of miracles, the essence of signs and wonders is not to prove that we are anointed more than others. It is just an expression of the love of God. It's dinner bell. Is the bell you ring and you call the kids, hey, it's lunchtime, it's dinner time. Come on, leave your toys and leave your wherever you are, come over less. So the, 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 the miracles, the signs that make so many of us feel like, oh, if he can do this miracle, if he has this spiritual gift, if he's able to do these signs and wonders, that means he's a great man of God or he's a great woman of God. No, these are not signs. The the signs and the wonders are not done by us. They are done by the spirit of God through us. And that same spirit of God can do it through a donkey, can do it through a cow, can do it through a monkey, can do it through a butterfly. He can do whatever he wants. It's, and they, they don't necessarily have to be spiritual. So the gospel is that encounter with the life of Jesus to a point where your life, my life is transformed. Transformed so that I don't have to speak necessarily before people can experience the kingdom of God, the nature of God that dwells on the inside of me. Amen. That is it. So the gospel includes the manifestation of the realities that Jesus has brought about in me. That is what the gospel is. And if you don't know what the gospel is, how are you going to present it? This is why we, the word of God is of no relevance. People in our society today are not looking for nice long words or quotations. 
They're looking for a difference, something different, something different from the usual. We're living in a system where, in a world where the medical science is not trusted, politicians are disgusting, they are not trusted, because if you listen to the community, to, to local people in our communities, everybody seems to be complaining that the politicians are not doing what they're elected to do. They, they, they are serving themselves, pursuing their own interest. So you see, people are discouraged, but people still need health care. But the health care that we have as uh, citizens of the kingdom, Jesus said in Mark 11, verse 17, uh, Mark 16, verse 17, you shall lay your hand on the sick and the sick shall recover. Have you ever attempted that? Bible did say we should go here to pray for the sick. No, he didn't say so. The book of James, Jesus did not say we should go pray for the sick. The book of James says, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil and prayer. He said, and the prayer of faith is what sick. It was James who was talking to believers. And he says, is any sick among you? So in other words, when it comes to health, we are the distributors because we have health residing in us. And when it comes to the issue of health, let me tell you something. Healing is not God's best shot for you. It's the enjoyment of a consistent, healthy life that is God's best for you. In other words, it doesn't even want you to be sick so that you don't have to need healing. And you see, the, this is part of the good news. This is part of the life of Christ that we have. And inside our spirit is the, the, the living God living in within the recreated human spirit so that the life of God becomes natural to us. And signs and wonders are no longer seen as miracles, but that is what happens. This is our culture. It's, it's normal. And this is what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to delve into the gospel of the kingdom first for yourself. Get marinated in it. Eat it. Enjoy it. And then when you show up, it manifests itself naturally. When you take a shower and you put a nice cologne, when you go outside to the public or wherever, you don't have to... Uh, shake yourself or do anything special for people to know that, oh, this person's cologne or perfume is so good. The, the fragrance just, it, it, it oozes out of you naturally because that is, it's, it's, it's that you, you put it on. Now we have put on Christ. And as we have put on Christ, Christ will be naturally made manifest wherever we go. So that the power of the kingdom of darkness will be pushed back, will be is already defeated. So we go and push it back. And then we, by our words and our deeds, we establish the kingdom of God. So I want to leave it right here with you. And I want you to consider what I'm saying. The gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Okay. And for us to preach this gospel of the kingdom, we have to change our strategies, okay, so that in order to be effective, we cannot continue to present it as hearsay and expect people to follow. No, there are so many hearsay religions around us already, full of nice words, but they offer no solution. They don't, they don't bring uh, deliverance from the guilt of sin. They don't offer eternal hope. It is more about works. You do this, do that, do that. Hopefully, the gods will accept you and give you a place in paradise. No, that's not what the gospel of the kingdom is. The gospel of the kingdom comprises of all that Jesus' death and resurrection made available for us so that as we have experienced it, and it is our reality, when you step out, naturally, you, you step out. Okay, and you live your life. You you manifest the culture of the kingdom. You express that what you carry. Jesus said, "From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." So, if there is an abundance of the kingdom of God in your heart, 
the mouth is going to uh, express it in words. If there's an abundance of the kingdom of God in your nature, you, you are going to act it out. If there's an abundance of the abundance of the kingdom of God in your, on your mind, you'll be thinking kingdom, talking kingdom, working into kingdom. Desire everything that you design and plan is going to revolve around the kingdom because that is what is in you. Until you have tasted it, until you are living in it, until you are staying rooted and grounded in the kingdom, you cannot be a carrier of the gospel because it wouldn't be good news from you. It will just be a hearsay. And this, it doesn't make us any different from politicians or religions, religious leaders. We are not religious leaders. We are agents of the kingdom. When the people look at us around where we live, they look at us with eager hope that they should, they, oh, this guy is here, this man is here, this woman is here. So there has to be a difference. And I want to challenge you in the name of Jesus, please. Let us delve deeper into the kingdom. Now, don't be discouraged. If, if you have not started experiencing it, and if you have to go back to doing everything all over again, it is better to get it right than never get it than to never get it right. I want you to know something. The Bible is, is progressive revelation. So what we knew then was smaller to what we are knowing now. And tomorrow we are still going to know much better because the Holy Spirit, who is a teacher, takes us to the degree to which we are willing. He draws us gradually, gradually as we submit to him. He draws us deeper and deeper into the depths of God. Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14. And it says, and the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, just like waters cover the earth. And in the book of Daniel chapter 12, verse four, the Bible also says that in the last days, knowledge shall abound. So even in our day, as children of God, the knowledge of the kingdom of God is on the rise, as well as the knowledge of science and so many other things that we are surrounded with. So knowledge shall abound. It is time for us to step back and say, am I handling the right thing? Is this all I can get? And if you know that there's more, don't be ashamed to step, because it takes a lot of courage. Only mature people can assess themselves and say, am I doing well? There are so many people that are afraid to, to, of failure or they are not sure of themselves. So they, they are not able to take a step back and assess themselves and say, what I'm doing? What am I holding? What am I doing? Um, what I'm doing, am I doing it the right way? What I, I'm prof I profess, is that the right thing? The way I'm handling it, can I do it better? So that when you do that, uh, you are going to see that the thing you are going to be more successful. Okay. Therefore, many things that we did not know then, we are knowing now. Why? Because the word of God says in the that the knowledge of the word of God shall be as profuse as the waters cover the earth. I want, I want you to know that the greater part of the of the of our earth. Earth is covered by water. You know that already. It's going to be in profusion. That is just an, an, uh, an expression. It's going to be profuse, just like water covers the earth. And it, that knowledge is supposed to be in your spirit. So today, if you hear me say, and you must have heard me say that many times, we have the nature of God in us. We share his nature. That is Corinthians. That's what Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says. And it is also confirmed in, in, uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, where we just read. All right. He said, when Christ was raised from the dead, the, we were quickened, the spirit. We were made to come alive in Christ Jesus. So the life of Christ is in, my, in me right now. So that when I speak to you, I'm speaking from that place. I'm speaking from that nature of Christ that dwells in me. That is why when I, I say somebody is blessed, that person is blessed. When I lay my hands, I get results. Why? Because I have it. And you too can have it. We are so, you don't wait to be a pastor or prophet, evangelist, apostle, or teacher. No, you are a child of God. We are the same. We share the same nature. And what we are commanded to do is to take this nature because we are the proof that this is, 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 a, is, is, is possible. And this is a reality. We are the proof. 
So our lives becomes the gospel as well as what we say becomes the gospel. So where we live in such a way that people around us are tasting the power of this, of this God, the life of this God, the life of the kingdom of God. And what we say carries, it's all about the kingdom because that is the only culture we know. The old culture is dead. The old lifestyle is gone. The old life is gone with all that is attached to it. We have a brand new life now. And that life is the life of Christ. Uh, we are no longer operating where we used to be. We were not only made alive, we were raised up. I was made alive in Christ. I am now, I have now been raised up. And not only was I, am I raised up to, to the level of Christ, I'm also seated in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I know a lot of people find this difficult to, to, to accept, but God will help you. Amen. Uh, and may the Lord help you with understanding. And, and as you dig deeper and deeper into it, you're going to see that this is truth. So we have to know what the gospel is so that we can present it accurately. If not, we'll be doing God a disservice. You cannot sell a product that you have not tasted. Taste the gospel. Don't just stop at coming into salvation and you say, yes, I'm good to go to heaven. No, the gospel is more than that. There's a, is, 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 there's a whole lot to it. The, the salvation you experience is just walking through the door. Jesus is the way, right? Is the door. That's what he says, John 10. Is walk coming in through the door. But you don't stand there outside by the, uh, you know, you go through the door. You don't just stand there. You got to get into the house. You got to get in there, sit down, relax, and enjoy what the house has to offer, what the kingdom has to offer. May the Lord bless you. And until I come your way again, keep digging into the word of God and marinating yourself, saturating your spirit, feeling yourself. Bible says, let the word of God in Colossians 3.16, let the word of the Lord dwell in your heart richly unto all application or unto all wisdom. Let the word of God dwell in your heart richly unto all wisdom. All right? Until I come your way again, stay blessed.